In 2006, a group of 50 retreatants gathered in Krakow, Poland, in preparation for an interfaith retreat on the grounds of the death camps of Auschwitz-Birkenau. The retreat brings together people of many faith traditions from around the world. American Zen master Bernie Glassman began the retreats as a way of bearing witness to what happened at the concentration camps. After his own profound experience of the death camp, Bernie sensed that Auschwitz could be a place to give witness to what happened there and could also become a setting to remember and to recognize those who died and suffered. Usually, the location for a retreat is isolated, tranquil, a place of natural beauty which helps to inspire meditation and reflection. How can people find peace and spirituality in a place of death and destruction? And yet here, every November, people from different faiths and from various countries come together to spend five days in meditation, stillness, prayer, and ritual. Why would people come on such a retreat? What are their hopes, their expectations, their fears? How will this week change them? Or will it? I grew up in the Bronx, in the Bronx, New York, and um, um, I lived, we lived in an apartment building, in a tenement kind of apartment building with um, my, I lived there with my mother and father and my younger sister. Um, my father um, was an immigrant. He um, was originally born in Romania um, to a Jewish family in Romania and he immigrated after the war. He was a, he was a Jewish Holocaust survivor. I have no one in my family that you know, experienced the Holocaust. Um, and it's not so much kind of the, the Jewish Holocaust in the background of my mind all the time, but the, the place of torture, the place of losing human humanity. Uh, for me, even though I'm a rabbi, and even though I'm so uh, affiliated with, uh, with my um, Jewish um, spiritual path, Auschwitz is part of the history of, of the humankind. My grandfather was uh, with the Nazis, and I found out that this is quite a, a strong influence for, for me in my life. I really saw how my, my grandfather, who, who was responsible for, for, for suffering and death of so many people, I loved him really, or I still love him as really, I was like his child always, because with my father it was not so, so easy. And uh, he, it was always this, we, we call it Schreibtisch Täter, so they always said in the family, he only was sitting on a, on a desk and writing. And it was a total taboo to talk about what he did. Until now, I really don't know what he did. It was really like the secret he was carrying, and the whole family just accepted it. I grew up in the Dorchester section of Boston. Uh, it was pretty much a parochial Catholic neighborhood, uh, probably a second generation of immigrant families. Uh, I went from the parish parochial school, St. Brendan's School, to Boston Latin School and into a whole new culture uh, completely of where most of my classmates were Jewish. Many uh, of the Jewish families were immigrant families from pogroms in Russia or, or uh, escapees during pre-World War II or post-World War II. It's not until talking later with uh, some very dear friends who've been friends of mine for you know, close to 45 years that I, we realized that we grew up in the shadows of the Holocaust. My knowledge of Auschwitz is that it was probably the culmination of a lot of the programs to eliminate the Jews and it got to be almost a factory-like system and very mechanized and bureaucratized and it was just you know, the culmination of a lot of maybe more sporadic violence that had occurred against the Jews in earlier years.
my father didn't really speak at, about his experiences during the Holocaust at all. Um, but what he did do was really weird stuff, <laughs> like um, we, we call it, he would um, sort of leak out stories without directly telling us what happened. Um, so he might be sitting and watching TV and a little child would run up on the screen and he said, oh, you know, they used to take babies and sw take them by the leg and swing them up in the air and use them for target practice like that. I had no context for it at all. I thought my father was crazy and um, I just sort of freaked out, dissociated. Where did my father come up with these crazy stories? I think I dissociated because I, I didn't understand it. I think there was, there's something that I was, I don't know, born with, I think, some sort of knowing that was not intellectual, that just came with me somehow. And um, I, don't really, I don't really know how to exactly talk about this, but it, it just, I came, it came with me. And I, I woke up as a kid with nightmares a lot, and just nightmares of big piles of dead bodies. I had always the feeling something has to happen in the world when I was young. What can I do? And it, uh, it was really this longing that, that something should, should be changed. Or, and I was also really a rebel for a time, I would say. And, uh, and then I was hap very happy to find the, the spiritual world. And I went to India, changed my name, and, and really went far away also from Germany and my family. I feel I had to, yeah, something was too much there also for me, to, to, so I really left it. And, and I, I, I was really looking for where, where is it going and where can I find my, my peace. Like that I, as a, as a granddaughter of my grandfather, that, that I'm so connected with what happened in the, in the Nazi time and what was hap also with his guilt and his shame and everything. And in his case, he was not able to express it or to solve it. So he, he took it just with him without finding any solution. When I was in college, um, I took a course called Perennial Questions. The teacher had us read Night, Ellie Wiesel's Night, and I read it, and somehow I knew, I just knew in that moment that, um, that it was my father's story. And then, from generation to generation, it can be that when there is a person, somehow I took it and I felt the guilt and the shame and all this. So I asked him if I could interview him about his experiences. He said, what took you so long to ask? <laughs> so we set up a series of interviews and, um, and it was really kind of intense because he'd never really talked about it before. And then that it's now time, that, that because I'm also far away from it, it's I'm not the next generation, but two generations more, that, that I have, uh, that I have uh, possibility to really look at it and then his shame and his guilt, that f I look for him. It took him a very long time to start talking about what actually happened in the cattle car and in the camp, but it, it, def it did come, so he, he really shared a lot, of, a lot of really powerful and frightening and moving stories. His, his father was a Hasidic rabbi in the town that he grew up in. And there were about 200, 250 Jews in that village, and none of them survived. And my father did. He was young and really strong. I can say, I'm so sorry what happened, or it's, it's so painful, or I cry his tears. And if this is happening, then everybody can come back to his place, and, and peace can really happen. Prior to the start of the retreat in Auschwitz, the group toured the old Jewish ghetto of Krakow. They visited the one remaining active synagogue. 
the other synagogues stand empty or have been preserved as museums. After the Nazis invaded Poland, the Jewish population disappeared. Most of them were sent to the extermination camps. Since we're not different, you know, me and my German friends, so I could be a Nazi. You know, different circumstances and, you know, I could be one. I have a little Nazi in me. Um, it's, not, it's not easy to, to, to recognize and it's definitely not easy to say that, but the potential of dehumanizing uh, the other is there. I remember also coming back to Israel um, and one thing that I felt and I, I saw it more after being here is the closure of people to, to acknowledge the suffering of the other side. Uh, like they, they jump to a different subject. If you try to, to bring it to... And there was one woman actually who told me, stop. I don't want to hear it because if I hear it, I will start to have mercy on them. And then I, then it's going to be dangerous because I will not be able to see them as the enemy. And they are the enemy. My understanding is that sometimes in life we may pass through being the, um, the person causing the pain and other times we may be the victim. Karma is a result of our positive and negative actions and that somehow this is just all going around and uh, it's just been sort of a chain or a circle of suffering. And Auschwitz or that example might be a very extreme example of just this continuous suffering but it's just part of a, a chain of events that's been uninterrupted because people are operating out of ignorance and not seeing the, the consequences of their actions or the humanity of the people that you know, they've dehumanized. And you know, that's sort of a muddled response, but that's a little bit how I would start to approach it. After spending a day in Krakow, the participants prepared to leave for the death camps of Auschwitz. Does Auschwitz not silence us? How and why would anyone even attempt to pray there? Coming to Auschwitz was always one of my uh, personal goals in, uh, in life. Uh, but I also come uh, to say Kaddish for uh, the many relatives of friends who've died here, whose families were destroyed here. Also, as a Catholic priest uh, coming from Krakow, where, which was the beloved city of uh, John Paul II, uh, has a special meaning to me as a priest to realize that I, no one has done more for Christian-Jewish relationships than John Paul II. And I think his connection to Jewish relationships is because of the proximity of Krakow to Auschwitz, as well as the fact that many of his Jewish friends disappeared from his midst as he, as he was growing up. And so for me to come here is, is also uh, to honor his memory and to uh, honor his memory of apology, too, for the ways that all of us in our ways may have been hateful or spiteful. I never thought that I'm going to come to Auschwitz. I had no relatives who had been here whatsoever. Uh, and I also don't like uh, the way that sometimes uh, Jewish or Israeli groups are coming and it's kind of claiming the Holocaust. But when Bernie did it, um, and he invited me to come, and it was in an international group. Uh, I felt I want to, I want to, I want to see this place. I want to experience Auschwitz, um, not amongst uh, Jews only, but with Germans, with Poles, with uh, Muslim people. I decided to come on the retreat because I had some knowledge of the, the Holocaust and uh, I wanted a chance to 
have a more in-depth uh, experience and also a chance to meditate on not only man's inhumanity as a man, but also to, to look more closely at um, how this affected history. I came on the first retreat and um, I found that I really, at the end of that, that first retreat, um, uh, one of my German friends said, are you going to come back next year? And I said, absolutely. I didn't feel as if it was complete for me. And um, I, f I felt it hasn't been complete for me. Every year there's something new that comes up, something further that needs to be explored. Um, in the States, I don't have a place to put a stone on a grave, which is a traditional thing that Jewish people do. And, um, and here I know I can come and I take a stone from Vermont and I bring it and I put it in the ash pit every year. And it just it, it feels like a completion for me to, to do that. I knew at one time I, I, it was like my soul was called to once go to, to Auschwitz. I just knew that that's it, and uh, it's somehow I'm even not nervous or, or I'm, I'm not afraid or it's, it's somehow too big. It's it's like it's not that I have any. Um, normally I'm all like, oh it's this or that. So but when when I now traveled, I felt I just know I have to go there. It's not easy to put in words. It's beyond words, I would say. And it's, um, yeah, it, it was like uh, in the morning. I was praying to, because it's the first time I come to Auschwitz. 
and I felt it's really big for me to touch the ground. And as you started to get more information about uh, the buildings and, and what happened there, uh, there was anger, there was just, uh, again, outrage at the inhumanity, and I did not want to stay stuck at the anger, I wanted to go deeper. And, and so getting in touch with the sorrow and, and just of what the people went through. To have time to sit quietly and um, be in meditation together with our group on the selection site. Um, it was, it was very deep. Um, a lot of, a lot of um, images coming through of the people that we saw, um, pictures of yesterday, who lived there and died there. Um, oh, the meditation was very rich. You know, I, I'm emotionally exhausted. Uh, I find uh, myself wanting to defend myself against some of the experiences, yet I strongly feel that it's important that I open myself to the full totality of the experience of Auschwitz and Birkenau as, as it's humanly possible for me to do it. You know, I also, uh, because I, I want to get that feeling of the place. It's difficult to come there. It's difficult to be open and feel the amount of suffering that is still present there. You, I don't know about you, but I, my system doesn't want to, to hear the screaming, to, to feel the suffering. It's, uh, it's really too much. You know, I've read the literature, but I needed to walk the grounds to get a sense, a physical sense of uh, how the earth felt, uh, to walk in the barracks to see if they were muddy floors, to realize that in Birkenau, uh, no matter what the season is, it's always going to be mud. The sheer destruction regime of uh, establishing uh, an orderly sense of killing and also subverted the lives of those who lived in such a way that terror was always in the air because people could taste and smell uh, the burning of human flesh. And so to it, uh, bear witness through prayer and to ritual to, to begin to honor that these were human beings and to know them by name, to see their pictures, to listen to their stories, to, in our own way, help to reshape the sense of human dignity to the people who were murdered here. selection site is where the trains came, the cattle cars came in to Bear Canal and where they let the people out. It was basically just, you know, mud and shit, just people falling out of cattle cars. Um, and it's where they made the selection of who would go to work and who would 
go to gas chambers. And that's the spot that we sit in. There are many places to sit <laughs> um, and reflect and do meditation in, but everyone passed through that place. And the men, the women, the children, they all fell out of the cattle cars to the spot that we were sitting at. I get a, a sense of uh, standing uh, from the selection spot and imagining you know, the confusion and the terror in people's minds, the sense of seeing chimneys and the smell, even though we don't get the smell, but you can hear a church bell ringing or a dog bark. You can see the extensive tracks designed to leave people in the midst of nowhere. And I think it's important for me to uh, be a witness to uh, the experience of people who were principally Jews, but people who were Polish intelligentsia, people who were uh, gypsies, who were gay, or people who didn't fit the order of the day. Have we learned anything from Auschwitz? Have we learned anything from Birkenau? Have we learned anything from the Holocaust? Because still the most vulnerable in our society are the, are the people being hurt right now. I felt it was very good for me to, to walk on the ground and, and really like see the beds and see the barracks and, and uh, like touching it. It was so different from seeing films or imagining or reading books. It's like uh, it came much more real and close. And it was these little stories of how daily life was or, or this, it, it brought me so, it was really, yes, it was really human beings went through hell. It was like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, very painful. I mean, sometimes I just started to cry. So to be reverted to a number, to have your head shaved, to have your individual characteristics taken away, to wear common garb that may or may not fit you, uh, to wear uncomfortable shoes, to uh, be fed only enough food for um, just to sustain life, but not enough to have your hunger satiated, is to have the gradual, radical uh, dissolution of all that is human within you. I think our work here is to recapture those faces, those images of people, their life stories, to give them back their names. I think it was uh, from just the physical shape of the buildings there, I thought the brick buildings would be better shelter for the women than the stables that the men were in. But when I got inside, it was just like a brick stable. And so just the, the conditions of the building were a bit of a shock. And then 
knowing that it was a place uh, where the women that were selected to die were housed, and some of them were housed in the um, courtyard because of lack of space there. But that was just chilling to know that, and uh, just the you know, the brutality in which you know the women were treated and the girls, and the fact that some women died there they, under the conditions before they even got to the gas chamber. That that was unsettling. I'd gotten to sort of the close of yesterday at a better place after going up and down with emotions and such, and, and here it was just there's more darkness to visit. And um, in touch with some of the anger as far as what, what code of warriors, you know, makes war on women and, and you know, brutalizes women and, and where's the honor in that? It just, you know, it just uh, couldn't make sense of it. It just, you know, who could do that? It was just, it was a bit of a shock. This place was uh, a barrack that was um, the last stage, the last uh, stop there, the dead end for women um, who couldn't work anymore <clears throat> or were sentenced to death, and to death and were gathered here in enormous numbers in this barrack with no food and no water. Some of them were sick, injured, or for various reasons, found themselves here, waiting to be executed or just dying from starvation and diseases. That's a very intense barrack. I wanted to come here and to say Kaddish together for, for the souls of these women who were here, who are here, um, if it's okay, I wanted to ask um, to have two circles, like uh, women inside, and women will say the Kaddish, and men will say Amen. In the midst of this darkness, to in different voices and different languages, Amen. begin to pray for those who had died, who had no one to say. Kaddish for Kaddish restores the ultimate dignity that a human has in the face of God, and a dignity that no person can ever rob. The one who has given the universe of peace gives peace to us, to all that is Israel, and say yes. I encourage you to go later and just visit them. Visit all the shelves, all the beds, and to speak to them. What could maybe comfort those women? And I want to sing for them a song that was written spontaneously for a woman and it says in Hebrew Oz v'hadar levusha her garment is made of strength and beauty and so she can laugh and smile to her last day let's sing it together and, but wander around and, and sing it to them and Look at their eyes. Let's connect with, with everybody that is here, was here. Bye. 
sadness in the air all the time. Um, real sadness and, uh, and real compassion. And, you know, it's just sad, you know. It's a place that thousands of women, of human beings were tortured to death. I ask them for their blessing uh, because I know there is a lot of work to do in the world and, and usually I go out from this place, from the, this particular barrack with a feeling of um, power, of empowerment, of yes, go do something, whatever you can. I had the opportunity to go out and uh, sit in the children's barracks at night when it was cold, the wind was blowing, there was rain. Um, I was surprised at how dark it was. I expected more spotlights, or, and uh, we were just having to pick our way through the mud and the rain and to get in there. And sitting on either the ground or later on the brick floors, I really started to get into the feeling of just how desolate that place is at night. To feel what it was like to go back to those uninsulated shelters at night with no opportunity to rest. Um, uh, it, it just really brought it home to me and at a deep, deeper level. We had so good company and, and that, that, we, uh, that we are together and that we can light candles and uh, it was very comforting. And the singing of this uh, Sleeping songs, his lullabies, just as comforting. You were singing from the back. It was like, uh, like an angel singing, and it, I was, it was good then to go into the singing and to walk around with the candles. It uh, felt good. And good night. I will whisper. Good night, close your eyes, say good night, I will whisper good night, close your eyes, say good night, I will whisper good night.
I was very touched to, to meet Marian and, and his wife. It's when they walked in and just to walk with them, it was such a blessing to be with them. And I, I felt so grateful that they have the courage to walk back to the place and, 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 and to share it. It was really... So already to stand with them there, it, it, it was like... Uh, I felt such a gift to meet them. And then for me to, to walk to the wall, it was like giving my tears to the earth. Like uh, this is all I can do. I can give my tears to the earth. If Tarnova Pershing transport them to Auschwitz. And from Tarnov I was taken in the first transport to Auschwitz. No, i niestety tymi rękami również się przyczyniłem do tego, że sobie sam ten grób wykopałem tu w obozie. And with my own hands, I built the camp, and I survived through the camp. And we had... He was 17 when he was taken in the first uh, transport, so we, meaning young people without job, without profession, we had to create our own world in the camp. And I was interested in art. So, so I was able to create my own world inside the camp that was based on art. Nawet ci bokserzy, ludzie, atleci, jacyś, ale bo ludzie bez wyobraźni ginęli szalenie szybko. Zaomywali się i... Because the people like athletes, like uh, of, of different professions, different uh, jobs, but without uh, imagination, big imagination, they would die very quickly in the camp. Ja musiałem temu strasznemu otoczeniu coś przeciwstawić, nie? And I had to oppose some, something to this horrifying reality uh, of the camp. There was no work outside for me, so I was taken to do this job of carrying dead bodies from the hospital block to the crematorium. I tam jest takie obrazowanie w jaki sposób. And there is the painting. And there's a, as there's a painting showing the way it was done. It was a, like a wooden uh, box, and there were four bodies inside each one. one and it had holes, openings in it. Because the, because the, the crematorium uh, we saw today, it was outside of the fence. To przez te otwory bagnetem sprawdzali, czy my kogoś żywego nie przenosimy poza druty. Bagnet? So through, through these holes in these wooden boxes, they would have, I don't know, yeah, I don't know the proper word for this kind of weapon, but it's like a long knife, you know? So they would pu put it inside through these uh, uh, holes to check whether no one alive is being brought out of the camp in, in these uh, boxes. Ja patrzę nagle, Marian Kajdasz, kogo ja mam rzucić na górę? But the, then I see, and I see the face of Marian Kajdasz, this close ja friend of mine. So I took his body uh, into, I hold it in my arms, like I show it here. So that's at least assure him a uh, respectful uh, ending. After 55 years, uh, I had a stroke and I was paralyzed. Yeah, I had to go to rehabilitation, groszku, pasoli, pieniążków. Ja zacząłem rysować, żeby te ręce usprawnić. So, uh, during my re rehabilitation, 
uh, instead of putting like a one seed or a coin from one <coughs> bowl to another as they used to start with at the hospital, I asked to be given a pencil and I started drawing. And this is all what we see here is the final effect of my rehabilitation after, after the stroke. If this illness didn't happen, I would probably never come back to, the, to my Auschwitz memories. power came from seeing hundreds of images that he had drawn uh, from his five years at uh, uh, the prison camp there. One of the images showed death and he was on the shoulders of death and death was very tired and, and barely able to hold up the sigh and he was just sort of laughing that death was too tired to kill him, you know, despite the fact that he had come close to death many times. Marian and Helena, for me, are shining, radiating figures. For me, they are a proof, a living proof, that one could suffer a lot and transform suffering into compassion and into beauty and into art and humor and not be bitter and complaining and thinking all the time that it's better to close up. Marian and Helena are open. I love Marian and Helena. They're, they're like saints. <laughs> um, his paintings are nightmarish, but Maybe that's what helps him be so peaceful, that he gets all of that horror out of him, which is something my father couldn't do. Um, he had no avenue like Marion to put those images outside of him. But Marion's really, his ability to not have any anger um, is really remarkable to me. I love him. <laughs> Ceremony in the tower, uh, it made me sick. Uh, it's not the first time but, uh, that it happens, but it happens. I just, uh, I collapse after this ceremony sometimes, energetically, spiritually, just <laughs> squeezes me. I realized there was some struggle going on with people about whether that was a good idea or whether some people could do that. But um, if we ever going to have peace and, and reach true peace, I think we're going to have to learn how to forgive the perpetrators. And, and I respect that that's an individual decision for people and the path they take if they choose to go that route is one that they'll do at their own pace. But I feel that we give a certain amount of power to the perpetrators if we stay locked up in hate and, and we don't pray for them as well. The most 
powerful uh, situation was the, the situation in the tower when we did the praying for the perpetrators. I could feel it already. It started perhaps two hours before already that I felt I didn't know what we will do there. I just read tower ceremony. And I felt so isolated and I, I felt like I'm alone and everything what I did in my life is wrong and I, I felt ashamed about little things. I would forget to bring my book to the, to the service and they had to give one to me and I, I felt so everything wrong. And I was wondering what, what's, what's going on, why, why this is coming up. And I know it for my life, this is uh, all this guilt and all this shame and, and uh, that everything what I do is wrong, it's just wrong. It was challenging and very moving and a little shocking to hear the German participants speak of their families and um, the pain and shame connected with that history. Um, to, to stand in front of us as children of perpetrators. I, you know, I, th I think children of survivors, um, it's, it's easier to identify with a survivor. To stand up in front of a group of, um, that, that's as diverse as our group is and share that was really, really touching to me and moving and courageous, incredible amount of courage. Um, and I have a lot of respect for the German participants who came here and really put their hearts um, in their hands and just, you know, showed their hearts to us like that. And uh, when I walked up the steps, I felt it getting so strong, I nearly couldn't walk up the steps. It was like I nearly couldn't stand on my legs. It was like uh, I was just praying that I would not go unconscious. Because it, uh, on one side, it was such a gift and so much love. It was more love than, than I could, uh, could, could take somehow. And it was also very, very painful. To, to feel this pain of, of this guilt. I was praying and praying and standing there and, and, and just trying to, to receive it and, and to pray for the souls of the perpetrators. And when the ceremony was finished, I was standing and looking out of the tower and seeing the whole camp and it was like, it was really like hell and it was just black, and I was like, I really thought I'm, I'm just collapsing and, and, and falling down. And then uh, Daria would come, and uh, she's from Israel, and uh, I know she lost her great-grandmother in, in Auschwitz. And uh, she just would ask me, how are you? And, and I was really, it, it, I fell in her arms, and I was just crying, and she was holding me, and. Uh, I couldn't believe that she would hold me with my tears. There's um an ash pit that looks like a little pond. I put the stone, I push the stone in there. I remember the first time I put the stone in, I kind of got my fingers muddy. Um, and when I started to wipe it off, I saw little flecks of bone on my fingers from the mud. It was stunning and I didn't want to wash my hands because I didn't want to just kind of wipe people's 
bones, you know, off me. And I didn't, I didn't know how to do that respectfully. It was really, um, it was really a shock um, to see that. I left and, and went out to um, one of the ponds there where the ashes had been dumped. And initially when I looked at the pond, it was very black, ugly and such. But then I started looking around the pond and, and there was grass growing and there were trees and the sun had come out and it was just a, a beautiful afternoon. And I reflected on all I saw and, and looking at the ashes and I touched the tree and I was just trying to struggle with reincarnation or, or some good out of this. And, and, and I just broke down and, and cried then, but it was, it was some relief and it was the breaking of the heart, but I think it was also allowing me to expand that heart to, in all that I had seen. Like a phoenix from the ashes, brothers and sisters, spread your wings and fly high. We are rising up like a phoenix from the ashes, brothers and sisters, spread your wings and fly high. We are rising up like a phoenix from the ashes, brothers and sisters, spread your wings and fly high. We are rising up. We are rising up. We are rising up. We are rising up. We are rising up like a phoenix from the ashes. Brothers and sisters, to spread your was plenty of opportunity to bear witness to the suffering here and at times it got overwhelming and, and it broke my heart. I will always remember the fact that people were punished and even killed for showing a little kindness to each other in the death camps and when people were willing to risk that and be humane when they're being reduced to you know inhumanity or to subhuman beings if they could do that under such circumstances, you know, what is our excuse for not, you know, showing kindness for people, you know, when we're free to do so? When I initially decided to come here, I thought I knew a little bit about the Holocaust, and yet I came in that spirit of not knowing or being willing to let go of preconceived notions and, and just be open. And I was humbled by the fact that there was a lot I did not know about the brutality, the systematized um, brutality, and the, the fact that I knew there was slave labor, that the people were literally worked to death, you know, it was a shock. And so I thought I was going to Auschwitz, but by opening my heart, I think I let Auschwitz come to me. I think the, the, the newest piece for me this year stemmed from Bernie's talk around the issue of torture and humiliation that happened here. And I really spent a lot of time thinking about that and dreaming about that and having childhood memories come back. The Nazis were my father's perpetrator and my father was mine and he was humiliated and tortured here and he was an abusive father. I feel like a shift around um, holding compassion for him, not just having it flow through me and then disappear and back to my being closed off and protecting myself from him, but um, I'm feeling like I'm just holding compassion for him, which is really different for me. My father's gonna die soon, 
I thought he, you know, for the last several, he's been very ill, and for the last several years, I thought, you know, every time the phone rings, I'm just waiting for the phone call. Um, but he keeps living, he's terrified of dying. He's a survivor. He told me once, um, after having been beaten very severely by, by a capo, he, he looked at the capo and he, I said, how did you survive that? And he said, I looked at him and in my mind I said, I'm gonna outlive you. And he probably has. Um, he, you know, he's, he's alive. I'm tied to this place in some mysterious way. Um, I'm tied to serving in this place. So I said, if if I'll, I said to the people of Auschwitz, you know, if I'll be called again, I'll come. God willing, I'll be. You know, if everything is okay. But it was really like uh, like saying goodbye to so many beloved ones. I can't, I can't say I will not come here again. You know, it's so difficult. I live with, uh, you know, this, this uh, holding of life and death and a commitment to serve it, uh, to serve God through both. Uh, it's not that I came here interrupted by something that I had to make peace with, you know, so it's not, it's not this kind of thing for me. Uh, but I live here with love. What did I really learn? Yeah. It's... I, I don't really know. It's it's more um, this awareness. When do I go over limits, or when do I hurt somebody, or when do I judge, or when where, where is this uh, limit when I'm not in peace with myself and with others? I realized during this process that that from where I'm coming being a descendant of a perpetrator, that what I could see or what I could feel was so limited from this guilt and shame. It, it, was, a, it was just occupied with this. Some moments, I get it. It's like some moments I can taste it. And it has a lot to do with being in peace in myself. Like how to be in balance. One morning I woke up, I, I had this question, how can I really love myself? And I thought, this is really stupid. You come to Auschwitz, always suffering, and you're just thinking about yourself and how to love yourself. This, this is not possible. This is really very selfish. And then during the day, I realized it's really important to love myself. Because if I really love myself and don't judge myself and I'm in peace with myself, this is the only way how I can love the others and how I can pray or how I can be in contact with, with the place and with what happened. I take from this retreat certainly the, the experience of all the people on our retreat and carry them with us. I think uh, in the last five days has been an intensive personal journey as we've listened to each other's stories and we carry those stories with us. I, I take uh, with me the question of Auschwitz uh, as, uh, as a lifelong question. Uh, that, the, that as I tried to listen to Auschwitz speak, 
uh, and listen to the, the stories of the victims and the perpetrators. And I, I don't think Auschwitz offers any answers. I'm learning that healing can be brought to very horrible circumstances through love and that the challenge to open my heart to these experiences and the challenges to, to love in these circumstances. And I can only do that uh, by beginning to connect with another human being. And I can only do that when I connect with prayer to a greater love that's beyond me. And to begin, begin to bring about a healing bomb to wounded people and a wounded earth. And the last line it says, this going down is for the sake of going up. And because of this, all this experience is worthy of going through. Ad shekol zehu kedai. Vida zo tzore chaliya Ad shekol zehu
it's not easy to put in words. It's beyond words, I would say. And it's, um, yeah, it, it was like uh, in the morning, I was praying to, because it's the first time I come to Auschwitz, and I felt it's really big for me to touch the ground. You started to get more information about uh, the buildings and, and what happened there. Uh, there was anger, there was just, uh, again, outrage at the inhumanity. And I did not want to stay stuck at the anger, I wanted to go deeper. And, and so getting in touch with the sorrow and, and just of what the people went through. have time to sit quietly and um, be in meditation together with our group on the selection site. Um, it was it was very deep. A um, lot of a lot of um, images coming through of the people that we saw. Um, pictures of yesterday who lived there and died there. Um, oh, the meditation was very rich. You know, I, I'm emotionally exhausted. Uh, I find uh, myself wanting to defend myself against some of the experiences, yet I strongly feel that it's important that I open myself to the full totality of the experience of Auschwitz and Birkenau as, as it's humanly possible for me to do it. You know, I also, uh, because I, I want to get that feeling of the place. It's difficult to come there. It's difficult to be open and feel the amount of suffering that is still present there. You, I don't know about you, but I, my system doesn't want to, to hear the screaming, to, to feel the suffering. It's, uh, it's really too much.